Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley Institute provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley Forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. We would like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting our forums as part of the Hinckley Radio Hour. Today's forum is a conversation with Congressman, Congressman Blake Moore and will be moderated by Hinckley Institute of Politics Director, Jason Perry. If you have any questions for Congressman Moore, please enter them into the YouTube chat. And with that, I will turn the time over to Hinckley Institute Director, Jason Perry. Well, thank you, Anne, for, uh, for the introduction here. And for all of you out there who are watching today, this is going to be some time well spent uh, as we have a chance to have a conversation with Congressman Blake Moore. And uh, as, as Ann mentioned, we'll have a chance to hear some questions from all of you. We'll take some time at the end, but, but if you have some questions, even as we're speaking now, just put them in the chat and we will try to address them as quickly as we can. And uh, this is gonna be a, a chance to, to hear from uh, one of our brand new elected officials here from the state of Utah. And uh, uh, Congressman Moore, you've been a friend of mine for a very long time, so I know you well, but I would really like a chance for the people out here in the state that don't know you as well, to really get to get to know more about you, how you got to this position. And, and there's gonna be some things about this position that are gonna be great to talk about today. I'm not sure I know of any newly elected member of Congress that has done more in their first couple of weeks than you have uh, here in Washington, DC already. But take just a moment, if you don't mind, and, and introduce yourself a little bit to me. And I'm gonna be disappointed if you don't talk about your uh, uh, quarterback scholarship to Utah State before you went to the U. People might well, not know that. Take, well, well, it won't take very long because there's not too much to report. So that'll be an easy one to cover quickly. Uh, I'll highlight, you're right. Um, this has been a very eventful six weeks starting off Congress. And I, as I texted you something earlier, we had a quick check-in about today. I looked back and above there on my text message and it was dated what was it dated? I think it was dated December 28th, where I said, hey, I won't hesitate to ask. This is going to be a wild ride. And I was right on that. I had no idea it was going to be this wild of a ride um, going into this. So uh, yeah, looking forward to talking to you all, um, giving you a little bit more context or an inside look into many of the things that I've experienced and uh, that I've been a part of. Um, it's been some very tough moments. Um, you know, that have caused me to reflect uh, lots and um, so, some harrowing experiences, but some really great, really great things with respect to, you know, creating relationships with people back in Congress, um, some amazing Americans that are out, you know, willing to do this work, uh, a lot of good mentorship that I've been able to get um, and go through some tough experiences and some interesting, tough, some tough votes. And, and then, the committee assignments. It was like the bright shining star. We were so excited about where we landed with that. With that, but just as a back, just as a brief background on on me, and I'll I'll try to keep it brief. And if there's other questions, I'm happy to address it. But um, more more importantly than the my red shirt freshman year up at Utah State, uh, I, I didn't get to go back and play at Utah State, which was uh, really disappointing. I served a mission um, for for my faith and in South Korea. And during my mission, my coach was fired. And so the new coach came and sort of cut all the missionaries that were out at the time, Me, like several roommates of mine. So there's three or four of us uh, that were, that were freshmen together and some other folks, I think there was like even a dozen that we kind of lost our scholarships. This stuff happens. It was a bum deal, but it um, gave me a chance to go live in Ephraim, Utah. And I went and played at, a, at Snow College and got to experience a lot of what, you know, I had, I've lived on the Wasatch Front my whole life and going into living in rural Utah was a, was a neat experience. You know, you just have to, you know, sometimes you can't control your circumstances and you just got to roll with it. And uh, it, it, it got me back up to the U where I was, uh, everybody in my family graduated from the U. My parents are both uh, Utes and um and I graduated, I was the youngest of five kids. Uh, we all graduated from the University of Utah. So I graduated in 2005. But when I came to Utah, my first semester was during the Olympics, right? So I, mean, I had this awesome internship at the Department of Economic Development for the state of Utah and got to, got to experience that. It was, a, it was a really great moment. I will be very, very supportive. I'm hopeful that the Olympics could come back to Utah at some point. Um, and 
and I'm hopeful that, that that's something that can happen. Uh, but born and raised in Ogden, Utah. I was 17 years old. I won, I won this national award called the Wendy's High School Heisman. Uh, that's, that's probably more significant than, <laughs> than the scholarship that I had. Uh, but it was an award that was given out by Dave Thomas. He wanted to highlight high school seniors that were, you know, for three areas, athletics, obviously, academics, and citizenship. Uh, so a male and a female win it each year. And the, uh, the citizenship part was something that I re reflected on a lot lately. Um, you know, an Eagle Scout service project, all the stuff I did with church and in the community type of events and from extracurriculars and school, all of that went into this sort of application that I was nominated for by my guidance counselor. And, uh, and we ended up, you know, I, I got to go, you know, we won it that year. I got to go back to the Heisman ceremony for 25 years. Um, it's been a really anything as a college football player, like something that has been pretty awesome. I got to go the year Alex Smith went. So I know that he became, if you didn't hear about him from many of these students that are in school now, probably don't remember, you know, remember his days playing at Utah, but they, they did see a, a guy that had 17 surgeries stand up and get in and play this year. That was probably, let's say the best story of 2020, which is a low bar, I understand. But anyway, um, it's a lot of that type of stuff. So I'm married, uh, my wife, Jane, we have three little boys, uh, eight, five, and five. They, so we have twins. Um, you know, so just a bunch of little league that we find that I still find a way to, to make work. And we just, you know, we, uh, we're, 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 you know, enjoying this, the, the, this phase, uh, my, my little boy, Winnie, he's, he was tested on the spectrum. Um, we've been giving him a lot of, you know, interventional behavioral attention over the last few years. He's doing awesome. Uh, so, you know, you have all those life, life things that come up. Um, meanwhile, it was a year ago. It was, I had, it was just, middle of January when an old friend of mine suggested, uh, you know, my mom worked for him as a, he was a Weber County commissioner. And he suggested, he said, Hey, you have a unique background to support Hill Air Force Base. Uh, Hill Air Force Base needs, you know, someone that can go and establish themselves in Congress and serve for some, for, for some bit of time. Um, you know, even though you're turning 40 this year, you're, you're still relatively young. <laughs> I don't feel that, but I, but I guess I am. And, uh, and that was what initially sparked my interest in whether I should do this. But I have a master's in public policy uh, that I got through Northwestern while I was working. I've, I've you know, been involved in po political matters before. I, I worked for Dan Jones, uh, which was an, a real honor for seven years. I worked for the prominent pollster of Utah and just kind of seeing the way he approached and thought about issues was really, really a, a neat experience. Um, you know, I, one of the last conversations I had with him before he passed you know, he kind of walks in the office. He's, you know, he's in his mid eighties, still dressed to the nines, was there every single day until he got too sick. And, uh, you know, just kind of looked at me one time. He said, boy, in his gruffy old voice, I said, don't wait too long to run. And I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm going to ever run for office, but I am interested in, you know, in doing some good. And, and, uh, you know, so those little moments, it all built up for me. So when somebody suggested you should give this a shot, like all those things came rushing in and then we, we my wife and i made a decision um with some fun negotiations there that, that you know that how did that, how that, did prepared that, go? Me, that prepared me for anything that i'll have to do with with speaker pelosi i mean these are hard-nosed negotiations it said just it was like there was a short time frame right like it, i was the last to enter the race so the election season was going to be short so the risk to running was relatively small sistro was going to be okay with me having, coming back to work I clarified, I made sure that was clear. Um, sometimes it's, it's really tough to run for office like this in the middle of your career, right? Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's why you see oftentimes politicians running for other political posts. Uh, so to kind of just jump ship in the middle of it was a risky, was a risky thing to do. So we, we, my wife and I had a lot of really, you know, good chats about this. And, and I think the ultimate thing for her was, all right, the risk to running is small. The risk to winning is large. <laughs> If you win, then that's a big change in our life. And uh, I'm going to need a little more help around here with the kids. <laughs> so, and I was like, deal, Nancy, deal. You know, so we, we joked about that. Her name's not Nancy. I'm joking about Speaker Pelosi. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was my first big negotiation. And I'm, I'm sure there'll be more. Well, uh, Jane is great, of course, as you mentioned, and, and I, I know you do have these, these hard conversations. Uh, as, as you think about, as you talk about that and your experience that led to this decision, one thing many people don't know is about your foreign service experience. 
uh, which also uh, has helped you not just already in this position, but will uh, in your with these committee assignments you've received. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I got to, I have a unique background. So I'll talk briefly about the two items from my background that are not what you would necessarily say, oh, that person is going to run for office. But when I think about it, and now that I've been involved, when I made my case for committee assignments, and I tell them my international experience, I tell them my management consulting experience, working in teams and, 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 and you know, going through this process where you have experts who are my clients, mm -hmm. and I go and I help them to you know, create a strategic framework or help them with some data collection, and we go and, and try to achieve you know, what their ultimate goal is. I mean, that's, that's the way I view a lot of this sort of committee work that you'll do in Congress, but correct. I, uh, I have a background with the US government, um, and like, like many, um, you know, I, I speak a second language. Um, so there's a lot of recruitment from the state department, the FBI, central intelligence agency. They all come to the university of Utah. They all come to BYU. They come to Utah state. Uh, and so I was, I was able to secure, you know, some interest from some of those. And later, um, about f a few months after I graduated and made some inquiries. I had a def the Department of Defense gave me a background investigation where I went and worked in some contracting work. Um, eventually got to go in to, to, to live and work in Southeast Asia um, and in and out of China. And then, and then back was doing some additional um, kind of like what you call it, um, home base service back in Washington, DC before potentially going out on another tour. And uh, I remember it was, we had just had Max at Georgetown Hospital. Um, so our first baby, it was hours before Hurricane Sandy hit. Um, and uh, like a few, weeks a, few, a few weeks later, we're home for Christmas and I randomly interviewed with Cicero Group. Um, so our, the big questions that we had after that Christmas break, Cicero offered me a job and the questions were, um, it was either gonna go to Manila, Phnom Penh or Salt Lake. And <laughs> my wife loved that third option by far the best. I was, I'm a more of an adventurous. I love, you know, the world and, 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 and look forward to more Codels where I can go and experience more uh, international work. Um, but it was the right time for us. And I came back to go work at Cicero Group, which is a management consulting firm here in Salt Lake City. Again, where Dan Jones was partnered with, with that firm um, and, you know, spent eight years working in every industry you could imagine, from trash and recycling to molecular diagnostics up on, uh, up on the University of Utah's campus with some of those companies there on Research Park, to education with George W. Bush Institute, to a nursing school, um, so healthcare, education, transportation, I mean, you name the industries, uh, you know, management consulting can sort of touch on that. Uh, many of you that are, you know, considering where your careers are, uh, you know, con consider it, you get to work with public private and nonprofit sectors across the board. That's probably what I love the most about it. And when I was interviewing with Randy Shumway for the final interview, that, that, that fateful Christmas time in, in 2013, um, he said, what's going to keep you interested in this? Uh, you know, you've obviously got a pretty unique job. You just got back from Singapore. Like what's going to keep you interested in this? And I said, for some reason, I have not been able to choose like this one industry that I want to work in. I would, I, I love the fact that from what I can tell, you work in every, virtually every industry. You have a skill set that can be applied across the board. And he looked at me and he goes, you're going to love it here. <laughs> and, uh, and when I went into his office eight years later and I said, I'm thinking of running for Congress. And he said, is it a matter of if or when? And I, I said, and he goes, is it a matter of, for you and Jane, is it a matter of if or when? And I said, I can sincerely say, I think it's a matter of when at this point. Um, lots of data point, lots of you know, things have led up to my life to be able to do this. I think it's a matter of when, and he said, you have to do it now and I'll be your first contribution. So I have a lot of um, respect for mentors in my life. He's one of them. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been, it's been the right decision and I hope to continue, you know, working through these challenges and, 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 and do some good back there. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you made that choice. And, you know, Randy Shumway is a good mentor to lots of people, always encouraging people to get engaged in some yeah. way. So uh, as, as we talk about that, that path to this particular office, can we talk about your first two weeks? 
You alluded to it a little bit, but let's talk a couple like really big votes, certifying the election, the impeachment. Talk about those two and your experience because you are right there through both of those, those experiences and also the, the rioting, right? The storming of the Capitol. Yeah. Yeah, I could cut me off and I'll try to be great <laughs> too. And so, cause I wanna be able to engage. Uh, the votes that I took in the first few weeks, um, this from many, many veteran members of Congress just said, this is unprecedented. Uh, this, this is something you'll, you'll never see. And then at the same time, Kevin McCarthy looked at us and said, but you may have to vote on a declaration of war at some point. And I can promise you that is so hard. That is something that is so difficult to do. And it was kind of a neat way to sort of put into perspective. This was leading up to the very first vote. Um, so I have a million thoughts on all of this. And so I'll try to keep it a little confined. And if I were to want to talk to a group of engaged, interested college age folks, thank you for being that all of you that are, that are, that are out there listening to this and, and thanks for being engaged and interested. Um, it's going to be important. You are the future. I feel like I can halfway represent, you know, you know, the, the, the next generation of, of Americans. And, I, and I've always had that as a piece of focus. Anyway, that's beside the point. What's important to remember is how much context matters. On some of these votes, I didn't have any more context than every one of you watching cable news shows. Um, there, was, there was no additional, everything was, it was out there. And on some of these votes, I had an enormous amount of internal discussions and um, motivations and understanding of why things were, were the way they were. So I'll just quickly break down the, um, the certification vote. Uh, it ruined, not ruined, but it sure overshadowed swearing in. And that's unfortunate um, because that was gonna be a really, really special day and I was extremely stressed. Uh, and um, I was back there with my wife and son and my mom who was by far the best campaign uh, volunteer that I had. <laughs> um, and it was just that the Friday before swearing in, we had, you know, I would, you could, we had a big conference meeting with the entire GOP, uh, with the house members, you know, discussing this, going back and forth. Then you saw things starting to play out. You saw Senator Hawley and a few other, you know, a couple senators say, Oh, I'm going to, object and you, nothing happens unless a, at least one senator decides to object in this situation. Uh, and at that point, something very, very interesting happened. And uh, this should probably be a case study. I would suggest um, Hinckley to, to, to consider something like this. Like, look, like wh see what happened when, when, when that moment hit, one of two things happened um, in the Senate and the House. In the, in the Senate, some senators, you know, backed away from the idea of objection. And in the House, more Republicans um, joined on to the effort. You know, why, why was that? Why, why, why would that be? I think there's lots of factors and I, I'm happy to opine on it, but I'll let you all sort of you know, think about that. Maybe, maybe worth you know, you, your forums and discussions, but that's, that's what happened, right? Um, the majority of House members joined in and the majority of senators backed away from it. Um, the interesting thing was, and here's what I will say, that, I, that it's very sincere when I say that it, on Tuesday, we met as a, as a GOP conference and everybody got to go that wanted to and share their opinion and thoughts and how they were going to go about approaching this vote. And that's when I actually gained a very good understanding of those that were going to object. Men, I mean, at the heart of it was election integrity. And the thing that I was most worried about was that those that weren't objecting were going to be deemed as people that didn't care about election integrity. And that was, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and that was the, one of the biggest things that was stressing me out um, because I knew where I was on this. And I, and I went through the rounds and I, and I went through the, the proper, all the discussions. Um, and what I ultimately came back to was that we, we have a strong separation of power between the Supreme Court and the executive branch. We don't have as we, that doesn't it, house the House of Representatives and Congress per, per se. It doesn't. It's it, that is not as clear as it is with with um, SCOTUS, 
And you think about it, SCOTUS is lifetime appointments. Members of Congress have to run for office every two years, right? There's just different dynamics that exist within Congress that are gonna motivate people in different ways. So uh, it was across the board, people were, you know, this, we need to stay, you know, this, this was the Republicans this time, this is the part that's so baffling to me. And I can probably say this with as much credibility as anybody because I chose not to object and I chose to certify the election is, is this was done by the Democrats several times. In 2005, it was done. It wasn't done to this level, but it was done to Ohio, which I believe could have changed the outcome of the, uh, the election, right? Um, didn't gain traction. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a big movement, wasn't covered very much. Um, this was, and I, and I said it in my House floor speech, I said, look, this precedent has been set. It's been done before by the Democratic Party. It's been perpetuated by us this time. We have to rise above this. We cannot continue to go on this road. And I appreciate McCarthy, uh, Leader McCarthy for suggesting that we need to address reform on, on this particular piece of the, the, of the constitution and we need to clarify this so this doesn't continually happen. Um, Cause I've got very, very big concerns of precedent being set and this just being a thing every four years. And that is not what our role is. So uh, I heard lots of constitutional arguments one way or the other. I aligned that this was not Congress's role uh, unless there was two slates of electors sent from these states this was not our this 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 was not our role. Uh, Chip Roy from Texas, I think, articulated some of that very best, in my opinion. You know, I'm on the side of somebody that's considered one of the most conservative members of, in Thomas Massey, right? And so this wasn't a test of conservatism. This was a test of your of where you believe your constitutional side is. Others that are just as conservative are on were on the other side and felt like they needed to to do this. It was it was what you call mental gymnastics. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and, uh, and then of course, um, you know, the riots hit. So I knew where I was on it. Um, I sat in there and as the debate started, and I'll just briefly tell you a couple things from the riot, um, from my, from my experience. Um, but, uh, the, as the debate started, we all kind of, we're, some people, sometimes when there's going to be long debates, members will go back to their office and just watch it on C-SPAN. I decided this feels very monumental and I'm very passionate about the way I feel about this. And I wanted to, you know, hear, really hear, hear this out because I've heard from a lot of my, my side's perspective, I hadn't heard the Democrats give their pieces about it. So I'm going to sit in and listen to this and I'm, and I'm, and I'm glad I did. Right. Um, not because, well, because I, I have a really amazing you know, a pretty unique story to tell as well, having been in the house chamber when it happened. I went up, sat in the balcony with several of my other members. They asked us to sort of spread out as we were gonna get into this debate. And I, I, so I was up there just kind of listening in. All of a sudden um, I walked out to the window. Uh, you could kind of look and peer out to the front and another veteran member kind of looked at me and he goes, they look closer than I've ever seen a rally or a protest before. This is, this looks, and I go, this looks a little ruckus, a little, little bit raucous. Like it, it kind of, there's a lot of energy out there and saw some you know, police officers running somewhere. I'm like, wow, this is, yeah, but whatever. Yeah, no way. Like, no way. Like they're, they're just going to be angry out there. And all right, so we go back in and sit down. And then a few minutes later, all of a sudden, I'm starting to get text messages from a lot of people, the team in particular. Um, and they make an announcement right as they come in and the house house administration folks uh, staff members start shutting all the doors which it was a little weird because they usually didn't have to do that that was that was kind of weird and a little eerie and then they told us to sit down and get out your gas mask and so they're like things just elevated um and they gave us it capital's been breached um uh so we'll come back with another announcement just stay calm you're like okay so that was the moment i could call jane she's like I'm seeing this on TV. What's going on? Getting a ton of text messages. Of course, half the text messages from my friends are like, are you okay? Is everything all right? And the other half are like, hey, how's that new job going? Hey, you like your new gig? You know, so plenty of that levity helped me get through some of it. Um, but to wrap up here, um, they started debate again. After we had learned kind of, you know, like, okay, this is tense. But they started debate again. So we're like, okay, things are fine. It was a few people, maybe, who, who knows? And then I'm getting word that the Senate chamber had been, you know, overtaken and there's pictures of people inside there. Uh, and the probably the scariest part was when the police rushed in. Um, that's the part where you feel like you'd have no control. Uh, you've, you've got a gas mask, 
You've got the police there barring each one of the doors. You have members of a few people. Of course, they were Texans and an Oklahoman. Love them. They're good colleagues of mine. They, they, they stood up and, and, and barricaded the door. The only real entrance, I guess, they could have gotten in. Um, there was guns drawn. It was pretty tense. And when you don't have control, it was, it was um, you know, very, very harrowing. Uh, some, a lot of commotion and like, we got we to focus everybody. We got to get some of the elderly folks. Once they told you you could egress, it became sort of like, okay, I now have some control. We're good. We're all moving together. We, we got through the tunnel system. They, they were going to put us in the cafeteria. And I looked at Chip Roy, I was with at the time. I'm like, well, Chip, like I pointed to my pin. I'm like, we're, we're the target right now. We, 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 can, we cannot all go back in there and sit there in this glass fishbowl. Um, we, we got to, we can't do that. And he looked at me and goes, oh, you're right. I'm just going to go back with my team. So I buzzed up and went back up with my team. Um, we hunkered for a few hours. Uh, actually, it was an opportunity when in hindsight being, you know, looking back on it, it was a good opportunity to gel. We're a brand new team. Um, it was it was interesting. So uh, it was scary. There's, you know, I was I was frustrated at President Trump's response. Um, I was frustrated at the at, at the way he um, treated or he, he spoke of Mike Pence. I think Mike Pence was um, incredibly honorable in what what he's done. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was it was an, it was quite an experience. Um, and then <laughs> what was funny and what I, what I think is important too, leading up to that vote. For two and a half days, we got just constant calls, hoping, saying, demanding, suggesting that I that I object and that I not certify. And then the next two days, all we did was get calls that said thank you for for not objecting and certifying. Um, and so it's 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 mental gymnastics, um, and it's you know, and then it continued on with other with other things. So let me pause there. Well, I, I really appreciate hearing that story. I know everyone wanted to hear that. I, I can't even believe this experience as people are, are, are storming the, the Capitol building. I'm so glad that you are safe uh, there as well. And we're watching it from home, I guess, like all the people who are sending you text messages, wondering what's happening, making sure you're safe. Um, and, and one thing I, I was curious about too, uh, when it came to the feedback you get, which is always interesting, uh, you, you hear from one side and then the other in this kind of order, typically based on what you, uh, the way you vote. But when you are looking at this situation here and you're trying to think about your vote, uh, it sounds like you, you, you are not given a bunch of extra context, but otherwise, otherwise, you know, other than what we have saw as well. So how did you go about deciding about that vote? Uh, were you getting, you know, what kind of pressure did you get from internal, from your own members, from your party, from others? I'm really curious vote. about that. For the objection vote? Yes. Yeah. Um, it all happened very fast. Right. Uh, so I started to see it take place over the weekend leading up to swearing in. And then I was able to meet with leadership, you know, individually, 10 freshmen go in and be like, what have you done? What, what, what do we have in front of us? What is, is going on? And they, the explain, you know, just kind of explaining how, how it all came out. So you got a chance to talk to leadership. Uh, like I said, this is where I relied heavily on mentors, people that I had met with and, and gotten to know before. Um, who I find be really, really objective, thoughtful people. Um, Dan Crenshaw, somebody that you know we connected over this really well, right? And uh, um, and uh, it, it was helpful and I'm very appreciative of people like Chip Roy for making the constitutional argument, um, so you could see it both ways. And so I actually we really dug into it, and I had private meetings with people, a GOP conference that wasn't tweeted out very much. Sometimes a lot of things get leaked from there. Um, and so what I know was getting reported on the press was very different um, uh, and about everything here. I did, I, and I can't emphasize enough, I, I did gain an appreciation for those that did choose to object. This was not, this was not something that only our party has ever done. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we get blamed for that a lot. And I'll, and I'll stand up for that, I, but, I, but I sincerely don't believe it was the right choice. That's why I made the decision that I did. Um, there was pressure, but it wasn't really, it was never pressure from anybody with, from within. Leader McCarthy, you know, you have McCarthy, Scalise, and Cheney, and they all voted differently, right? And I think that's something that can actually represent, a, you know, a, a more a diverse way of thinking. It doesn't have to just be one way, you know, per party line vote. A lot of that happens in DC, and I'll, I'll get to that. But um, uh, I looked at Speaker, uh, Leader McCarthy and said, does this, does the way I vote affect my committee assignments? I'm here to help, to support Hill Air Force Base. That's my, still my primary focus. Uh, and it's like, a, oh, absolutely not. And actually, 
that was clear. That didn't, the, people, the way people voted on impeachment, anything, none of that affected the way that your committees work and, every, and all that. Um, so clearing, a, just being able to clear some of those things from the barrier was helpful so that I feel like I could go out and make, make my choice. Um, and, you know, and I made the, made the decision that I did. Um, but yeah, it, it's, that process was, was very different than the impeachment vote. Mm -hmm. Like I literally, I was flying back to Washington DC, getting my very first FBI briefing. That FBI briefing was on CNN and Fox while I was flying on the, on the TV screen, no different than anybody else. Um, and, and so I use a framework to make these decisions that I hope I can continue to use. Um, and, you know, you won't really be able to tell what type of principled politician I want to, I, I can be until let's say I'm in the majority and will I still make those type of principled decisions, right? So for this, it's a very high bar to remove a state's electoral votes, to object to a state's electoral votes. It's a very high bar. Um, impeachment needs to be a very high bar. We had 48 hours to make this decision. Um, I didn't know what and who knew when, what, did anybody in the administration know if there was people that were armed, ready to go? I mean, like all of those questions remained unanswered. Speaker Pelosi knew that they had, they could get all of their members to vote. So they were able to, to do that. I've never once said there doesn't need to be, need to be accountability. I, I saw the accountability a different way. And so I signed on to a, 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 resol, a central resolution. The 14th amendment was being discussed. All of these different options of constitutionality and what could actually be done in this situation with only a two weeks left, that was all going on. And so I just used a framework that said, I need to remain objective. I went against my party on the first vote. I'm going with my party on the second vote. But that's not why I'm choosing it. I'm choosing because I needed to be a high bar. I needed to be able to have the justification to be able to reach that high bar. Um, and it, you know, and again, that framework took me in the minority and in the majority. And it will kind of hopefully I can continue on with that 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 process going forward. Yeah, no doubt that you will. I, I, I hope we can get to these committee assignments you talked about here in just a moment because you are on some significant committees. But there's one question uh, from the audience I'd like to I'd like to give to you now too because it, it gets to the heart of this as you just as you just explained. Sometimes you were with your party, one time you were not on this one, sticking to your own principles. But the the question is that uh, you campaigned on working across the aisle to get things done. To what extent do you feel like that has been possible so far? And what barriers to bipartisan action have you found? Thank you. Um, let me recommit and reemphasize what my commitment is to it. And I can highlight an article that was just released last week by Roll Call, where about three fourths of the way down the article, um, the, the, the author said, um, and many other, and many members of the Democratic freshman class highlighted Blake Moore as somebody that they could potentially you know, co sponsor legislation with. That was a badge of honor for me because I went out of my way to go make relationships. It is all about relationships back there. Um, and, and none of that affects my conservative principles. It does not affect that at all. And I'm, I'm working on tearing down that barrier. Um, and there is a lot of people that are. Now that we've started committee assignments, I was just on a committee assignment, a committee hearing today, an enormous amount of you know, good decorum and civil discourse, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that is good. And there's, there's relationships and, and, and there's a lot that's going on. You will not see it um, necessarily in the press much, but, but it does exist. Um, what I will say though, is it is gonna be a lot harder than I thought. <laughs> and when, um, if, it, if we could rewind back to November, 2020, the, um, the, 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 the administration was going to change to a Democrat party. The House, the Republicans didn't lose, a, didn't lose a single incumbent seat and picked up more than anybody, more than the, that was expected, creating the most narrow margin in history. And the Senate was close, but it looked like at least David Perdue would be able to go on and, and win, a, um, win his runoff election. And I believe that if, that if they had used ranked choice voting to get him over that 50% threshold, you all in the Hinckley, you can figure out if ranked choice voting is the right way to go about. I'm gonna leave that one to you. Um, it, it's worth considering. There's, 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 there's things to, to consider there. Some states have implemented it. Is it important to get over 50% when you have multiple part, when you have multiple candidates in the race, more than two? Um, had, had Atlanta or Georgia do that, um, I, I, I believe that Purdue probably would have gotten more second place votes. But over the course of those two months, a lot of that left, a lot of Republicans stayed home from, from voting. 
um, those swing dis those those swing voters, those those third party voters probably went and supported Democrats that and end up losing the Senate. So in November, though, you have um, the narrowest margins in history, right? Uh, not maybe not history. Don't quote me on that. But very very narrow. That should be that should be a mandate to from the country, Congress. You need to work together. Um, you, you there is gonna there's definitely gonna be a few Democrats that are willing to come on to you know re Republican um, policy making with respect to energy or agriculture and things like that that a lot of people can agree on in in, in a lot of cases. Um, but with the events of the last few months, um, you know, and in the Senate flipping. It's given, you know, the, the Democrats will look at this next two years a little differently than maybe they would have if they hadn't lost the Senate. It would have been, um, there'll, there'll be, a, there'll be a, a, an opportunistic time frame to go, hey, well, we, we really believe this is the best way to approach COVID. We really believe you go really large in this package and that will help. You know, I, 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 I'm listening out, I'm listening to, the, to that side of it and willing to except that's the way they view it. I, I would view it differently in, in many different cases. I would have hoped that we could have come together on something again. Um, so it is gonna be tougher to have that bipartisanship. It's getting, right now um, with the ability to use a budget resolution to get some of this through the Senate, um, it, it will be up now. The, the Republicans used budget resolution too, a few years ago to get what they viewed as the tax policy that, you know, so it's so much back and forth and, and, and going on. Um, but with a Democrat House, Senate, and administration, I am not as hopeful that there will be more bipartisanship. Um, I'm willing to still commit to it and try and do what I can. But that's the that's the reality, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I will say uh, that I've been impressed by is uh, how much influence our delegation has in Washington, D.C. From you, from our other members of Congress, from our senators. You know, sometimes they're on opposite sides of the votes, even most recently. But it's interesting to see what kind of impact uh, the Utah Way has in Washington, D.C. And I'm, I'm kind of curious how you've observed that. We talk about it all the time. And from, from you giving your first floor speech, which I was, I was happy to, to be able to watch from here in the state of Utah to, to our other members of the Senate, it does seem like we have maybe an outsized impact on policy in D.C. We do. Um... I don't, the Axios just reported today that three of the top 10 cities in economic recovery are Ogden, Provo, and Salt Lake. Logan and other areas get highlighted as small cities that are doing really well. Uh, I don't know if we're just kind of emboldened by the fact that we have a really good makeup. We have a very diverse economy. Um, we're, we're a strong economy, but also the most philanthropic state. And there's so much good that comes out of Utah. We'd be emboldened to go do that. I would say though, to pinpoint it, um, right now we have uh, Chris Stewart on appropriations committee, one of the most important committees in Congress. John Curtis was there, what, three years? He's been there three years and just got put on energy and commerce. One of the most important committees. There's, there's four A committees, right? Like they, they rank them in these, these ways of jurisdiction and everything, it's ways and means appropriations, uh, ENC, and some degree uh, folks will consider financial services there. Um, we have, you know, those two are on those two top committees. I was able to, as a freshman, get my top two picks um, with um, armed services and natural resources. Very, very important committees to Utah in particular and my district. And Burgess was placed onto judiciary, which is, uh, you know, control, it just has so many things involved elsewhere. You look at Orrin Hatch, you know, the, the impact that Orrin Hatch had as a longtime serving member, um, pro temper at some point, right? I mean, we've, we've, we've got a good track record. I think there's a good reputation. We don't really become big time celebrities, but I believe that, you know, I walk into any, I walk into any committee, steering committee uh, members off, office when I was, you know, trying to lobby to get on these certain committees is you have to make your case and you have to push for it really hard and then but not damage your reputation. It's a delicate balance. And I would walk in and say, look, I'm not here for the tweets. I'm here for the committee work. I want to roll up my sleeves. I want to be the most prepared person in the room. Um, and just, we have that reputation back here. And I, and, and that obviously gets missed um, quite, quite a bit because, um, you know, you know, I'm not, this is the kind of stuff I like to do. I like to spend an hour on the Logan radio the other day. 
I, I'm not a big national, my, I've only done one like national interview on C-SPAN, right? And I enjoyed it and I will, and I, if that's more of my shtick in the future, great. But we, we try to focus and keep what's, what's important and really dig into the specific issues. And, I, and Utah has a good reputation there. Absolutely right. Well, can we talk about that House Armed Services Committee? Uh, you look at your district, the, the first congressional district, the northern part of the state, and one key part of that district, which has been protected by members from that district for a long time, from Jim Hansen to Rob Bishop, and now to you, which is what's so impressive. How big of a deal is it for Hill Air Force Base and that in incredibly important part of our Utah economy that you got put on this very important committee? I did a full immersion tour yesterday at Hill Air Force Base. And it would have been, it would have been tough to be there without being able to secure a spot on Hill on, on Armed Services. So I was thrilled to be able to do it. Um, winning a few extra seats for on the Republican side it helps the ratios a little bit. Um, we weren't confident that we were going to be able to get on. It's a very requested committee, um, you know, especially among freshmen. I think there was, you know like in my, in, for the two years ago, there was only like one or two freshmen that it got on it. We had several more this time because our ratios were, were, were healthier. Um, so it is a big deal. And in what the, the, the reason why it's a big deal, and I'll get a little policy wonky here for a minute is here, Air Force Base exists under the DOD, obviously. Um, but there is unique elements to each base that, um, they need congressional support, uh, and there's a there's it's a competitive environment, right? And there's always there's always the the the, the looming concern of BRAC, where you know, base realignment um, takes place and closure, base realignment and closures that takes place. It's this it's this big big concern that people always have. Uh, Hill Air Force Base is in a great spot. Um, the Utah Test and Training Range adjacent to it provides you know a real strong value proposition. And so our job in Congress is to make sure the, tra the training range has what it needs and that the F-35 contract um, is, is strong and that um, that exists here at the Hill Air Force Base, the sustainment work that we do on it. Most, most all F-35s come through um, and work with the software engineers um, at the Hill Air Force Base. And so all that kind of comes through, uh, you know, late in Utah, right? Um, it's a nexus for it and the entire Minuteman nuclear deterrent you know, there's three sides to the nuclear deterrent. One is through submarines, one is through air, and one is through ground, right? And this ground-based strategic deterrent, GBSD, is um, the nuclear silos that, you know, that deter other countries from, you know, conflict with us. And so we're going to, you know, redo that from the Minute Maid, um, which has been, which is currently in existence. And over the next seven years or so, we're going to, you know, it, it it was only supposed to be in existence for 10 years and it's been in existence for 50 and it, the infrastructure is low and we need to, to, to remove it. So our job is to build these priorities into the National Defense Authorization Act. And that goes directly through the Armed Services Committee. So we can go and lobby and make sure that, you know, interests of Hill Air Force Base are prioritized. Um, and that's just kind of in a little bit of how the system works. So uh, take just a moment to get to one of the uh, comments from our, our viewers as well. You're also on the House Committee on Natural Resources, which is also a significant committee, particularly for issues here in the West, which are not always considered, it seems, maybe by those on the, on the East Coast. And so talk about how you're going to be able to use that position to help the uniquely Utah issues. Good. I'll be brief here um, so we can get to some of these questions because they're excellent. I can see them right here. The coolest part about this particular committee, the ranking member of House or Natural Resources is actually flying in on Friday to attend John Curtis's climate, uh, climate change summit. Mm -hmm. He wants to make sure that from the Republican party, we are presenting solutions and not just being like a, you know, no to the Green New Deal. It's, it's gonna, you know, no to this. We, we wanna be providing solutions and he's, he's been a leader in this. And so um, I can't highlight the great work that he's been doing. So he's got like 25 members of Congress coming in. I'm taking some of them to dinner on Friday. We're excited. And then we've got a ton of snow too, which is great. But they're all coming in for a summit where we're going to have a couple, day and a half of just policy discussions and, you know, working with industry leaders and in, in this space, I'm coming up with good solutions. My job on natural resources will be about balance. How do we balance our environmental needs with making sure that, you know, we can, you know, we can leverage 
our natural resources, right? Essentially is what it is. There, there, there has to be balance here. Um, and uh, I just, there's, a, it feels like there is really good discussions going on. I, it, we're just in a waiting game right now um, with, with respect to President Biden's moratorium on federal, on public land. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that ultimately comes out, but I'm working with Department of Interior and trying to develop relationships with folks so we can go and just create, you know, reasonable policies that are, that are good for Americans that um, will get to the heart of what we need to do in, in, in the environment. One thing that really doesn't get portrayed is the industry itself, oil and gas, these industries, they are, they are trying to stay out of head of any and all regulations. Um, and they're doing, and they're, and they're doing everything they can to to balance that, um, you know, USU Basin campus out in Vernal, like works directly with oil and gas companies out there monitoring air quality measures. And, and there has been many advancements made, technology helps here. Um, how do you go about balancing re and then investing in renewables? Like it's all has to be a part of the equation. And so I think on that committee, that's where we get into those topics mostly. Perfect. You, you mind a couple more of these audience questions? Please. You got a lot of people watching with some good questions coming in. I'll, just, I'll go to the next one that I see. Uh, do you consider current and planned levels of federal spending and debt problematic? I ran on two big topics. I want to, you know, a strong economic recovery, but we have to have a reversal of our debt, 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 um, of our, of our deficit first. Um, we're sitting at 28 trillion and counting. It will, we, this is, this is not something that we can, you know, just come out of. Like I, I ran continually telling people about 1997. I talk about it like it's this, you know, this, this, this unicorn of a year. It was within our lifetime. Like those of you on the call, like it was within our lifetime to see the Clinton administration and a Republican led GOP house work together and create a balanced budget. Um, I have, you know, I, I, Director Panetta, Secretary Panetta, Leon Panetta, he led that from the administration side. And if you want to read a really great book, read Worthy Fights by Leon Panetta. Um, he's kind of a centrist. He he's, um, was a congressman for a while, and then he served in an enormous, many, many different capacities, um, honorably, I believe. Um, I, I, you know, and I now serve alongside his son. His son, Jimmy Panetta, is in California. Um, one of those relationships that I'm developing with folks from across the aisle. It, it, uh, and then Newt Gingrich and John Kasich on the Republican side balance the budget. And it's, it's doable. It just takes discipline. And, and it's going to be a lot harder now that we have so much interest that we're paying. Um, and so I think the, the framework is you know, you do have to first grow the economy. You have to establish growing the economy. But what we've what we've missed for the last 20 years is a president that is so, you know focused on getting us back to that balanced budget that that, that the Clinton administration was able to do. Um, and there had to be compromise because he then was faced with a, a Republican House, and so it forced that compromise, which is is good. It should happen. Um, so it's it's uh, it's we have to get back to it. Um, there's plans every year to do it. You grow the economy, you get entitlement spending and um, reform done in order to address it. And that doesn't mean just a bunch of spending cuts. It means, you know, thinking about Social Security in a different way. Is it, do we do we have to with, with do we have to raise the age? Is there more private sort of incentives that we can do to get people to save on their own versus you know creating a big structure? There's so many things that are going on in that space, but you get entitlement um, addressed. Deficit spending is, or uh, discretionary spending is, um, needs to always be on the table as well. We need to be able to look at our defense budget. I, on House Armed Services Committee, I will be one that says, I've lived and worked under a DOD budget before. I know there is waste. I know we can find ways to improve. And at that point, once you get that underway, then you look at revenues again, in my opinion. If you just raise revenues, it will continually be good money going after a, you know, a bad cycle and you'll never be able to get out of this debt issue. And so I'm sincere that I wanna be a part of this reversal of debt culture. I ran on that principle um, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm doing what I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm joining groups that are talking about it and working on it and, and hopefully, we can, hopefully we can come together. 
Mm -hmm. Talking about some of the impacts on the economy, you have a question from somebody asking about your, your thoughts on the Restaurant Act, which of course money set aside, uh, introduced in the Senate, passed uh, there for some relief for restaurants. So this is what I've constantly harped on. Targeted aid, right? There are many industries that were fine. There are many industries that did better during, the econ during, during this. Many people's um, incomes did not change whatsoever. Um, targeted aid is things we have to do. Restaurants, hospitality. Um, it, right when the pandemic hit, like it was an emergency. We had to shore up the agriculture community. There, there, there was PPP loans that were, were, were used effectively. Um, but as we continue on, we have to be able to find those areas that, 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 need, that need specific targeted aid. Um, Congress was never able to, 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 to decide and agree on what it would be. The Restaurant Act, if I don't understand it, I haven't read through it. So I, I, I will say this naively, um, you know, without having dug into it, restaurants were hurt big by this. And that creates, and, and, that's, and, that's, and, that, and that ultimately then goes and hurts lower income people and exacerbates the problem. And, and that's where the focus needs to be. So I, I like that we can kind of pinpoint that. All right, uh, uh, one more uh, question from the audience and then I wanna do, just do a wrap up with where you see things going here uh, in the future. The, the next question here is uh, the, the RNC has announced uh, an election integrity committee. Any thoughts about how to improve election integrity and reduce fraud? So I said back in August that you know, I have concerns. States were ramping up mail-in balloting measures um, very quickly during the pandemic, right? Uh, and this is my point on everybody on January 6th cares about election integrity, no matter whether, whether they voted. And I know, and I can say that with sincerity from at least my party. Um, and so I, I have many concerns. And what I keep telling people, what I've offered countless times, come to Utah. We've been doing this since 2012. We've, uh, you know, we, we have really strong measures in place. I spent two and a half hours at the Weber County Elections Office in late December during the holidays, because I knew that this, this conversation was continually going to be going on. Um, and I just went through their process with them and asked them how to do it. Uh, you know, the burden of proof of, of voter is shifted in our, in our process now. Before you would show your ID, you would then get your ballot, stuff it in the ballot and be done. Right now we're doing a ballot. And then there's a, there's a, a the way working closely with the driver's license division, there's a way to verify all that. It's done in just a different format, but it's done very well. And Utah has an incredibly good process. So on this, um, this type of committee, like I have offered numerous times, like, come talk to, talk to Utah. Dan Crenshaw even put it in his podcast. He goes, you know, Utah's had a really good process. I think it was because I nudged him on this one. Um, and so I want to be, you know, however I can, well, you, know, you want to be involved in everything. You sometimes just don't have the time. Um, but we need to make sure that Americans feel comfortable and confident with, with where things were. Um, and uh, I hope to be a part of that solution. Okay. Uh, uh, just the last five minutes, if you don't mind, uh, Representative, uh, you've already co-sponsored uh, 11 bills, maybe more since the last time I looked at that, which is a pretty good number. Talk about uh, the things you want to get done here, things on your plate right now on behalf of the state of Utah that we're going to see from you over the next coming weeks and months. So in particular, we, when I was interviewing my legislative team, I had asked the question like, hey, what would you want to get? What, what do you see as some priorities that we need to do? And there was a really cool idea that was presented. We are working through it. We don't know what kind of... Um, potential it has, but we're working through it. And I think it would be something that would be really productive and it should, should be able to get bipartisan support is um, many things done at the federal level become overly bureaucratic. Uh, it's just a reality, right? I'm a strong believer in the 10th amendment. I believe states, because I'm from a state that does things, many things so well, I, I, I believe that there's a lot of options there. And I think that healthcare could be better addressed if we were to have more control at the state level and education across the board. That's what I loved about Every Student Succeeds Act is that it actually decentralized some of it and it pushed it back to the states. Um, one thing we're considering is creating a pilot program with federal student loans and maybe block granting them back to the states and letting the states, letting a few different states run this 
and see if they're, you know, how, how well they're able to do it based on certain parameters. We've had people give us ideas on what needs to be addressed here. Um, and so we're, we're, we're thinking along those lines. And this, this, is, this is obviously things related to natural resources and armed services are gonna be top priorities for us. And so we want that. Th those are sort of given, to be honest with you though, although we're working, that's where the majority of our time will go. But if we could go and improve a way that we address um, federal, federal student loans, keeping it affordable, keeping it um, so you know, students can go and, 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 and engage in the in, in an education community. I want to be a big proponent of workforce development. Like, what does the industry need, and how can we back backfill our educational op, you know institutions with with um, the right type of regulation that would allow for that to take place more easily? Like, we see a lot of industry leaders in this, and there are many in Utah. I mean, if I look at what you know Utah's educational institutions are all doing from across all of our universities to our community colleges, to our tech centers. We are focused on the you know, jobs of the future um, and, and building and helping education, you know, get along those, get along that, along that route. Um, there'll be more one-off opportunities because they won't necessarily be directed to my committee work, but it's something that I, that I care about. And I, and I think can, you know, a strong economic recovery comes from skilling up our workforce, educating our workforce. Um, and, and hopefully we can, we can, jump onto a lot of those initiatives. Well, that's great, great answer. I'll tell you, when you think about jumping in, you know, sometimes in the past, there's this time where you kind of, uh, you, you wait out for a little while before you start swimming. You had no, no chance to do that. You got, you got thrown right in. And, and I'll, I got to tell you from the state of Utah, we appreciate what you're doing out there. So glad you're safe and you're representing us so well. This has been a great opportunity for our students and people to watch uh, this conversation with you, Representative, because you represent such an important part of the state of Utah, uh, something that is a huge economic driver, but so many other things as well. Thank you for all you're doing and thank you for being with us today. Thank you all for engaging. This has been an honor. I love doing this, so I appreciate it. Hope we well, can... appreciate you. We stand by, and thanks for taking care of all your tunes out there as well. And thank you all for watching. This concludes our conversation. Uh, we appreciate you engaging with us today. Thank you. Okay, and we're out.